yeah, like a lot of them said that that's kind of how they make friends and things like that this term around. So they've all really loved that part of it. And I remember that was like something I had in first year as well. Yeah, they, they, they said they like being forced to have friends in first year. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the whole appeal of first year. Um, any, anybody else want to answer that question? <laughs> I mean, so technically, I don't give the lectures online because in Mount 115, we have pre-recorded lectures for everyone and then the instructors just, just give the office hours. But um, so how the virtual office hour differ from one that I would give a person is that I actually I prepare a lot of stuff for the office hours because I feel like the first years, they're rather shy and I want to encourage them to ask questions. And so I feel if I just be there during the office hour, then I mean, they show up, but I don't, don't um, ask them. So um, I try to encourage them to ask questions. Sometimes I play a game with them, which has more or less success. And <laughs> sometimes I do extra exercises and give them time to work on them for five minutes and then we come back to class to solve them together. And that seems to work. So doing also exercises um, together, then really they, they ask questions what I, what I don't and about what I don't understand, right? But I think if you would not give any kind of tutorial, then they would not ask as many questions. I also implemented peer review in my class. So we're gonna be asking students how they like that. So they actually mark each other's work. And so we'll have to see how that goes. And we have our TA space basically checking to make sure the marks are reasonable, but the, uh, hopefully they learn better by doing this, especially since there's no final exam. We have to try and assess them a little bit differently. Yeah, has the marking scheme kind of changed recently? Like, is there like a weight more on like individual assignments and less on exams you would find? Um, open question for anybody. Uh, yes, uh, we've learned through the spring term and probably a bit of the winter term that it makes a lot more sense. We can enforce integrity, unfortunately, and um, you probably know, and it's, uh, we've heard through the engineering office and through the, my faculty, the math faculty, that the number of uh, disciplinary cases associated with cheating has gone, has skyrocketed actually. So the plan is to try, the goal is to try to make a lot of assessments and not worth as much um, to kind of curb that uh, loss of integrity and, and, and proctoring. At least that's what we've been doing in the math side. And I think that's true elsewhere, but I'm not sure. That's, uh, that's what um, <clears throat> I'm doing as well in my course is, you know, the, the, we have a written assignments for 30% instead of the usual like 10%. Uh, and then we have um, mobile assignments for 20%. And then we have three tests worth evenly weighted worth 50% and they get 48 hours to do them. So we're trying to take all the pressure uh, off the students to, um, you know, cheat or go online and look for solutions, give them lots of time uh, to work through the solutions on their own. So I don't know if it's 100% effective, um, but I, I hope it at least takes the pressure off the student and doesn't put pressure on them to, to make a, a bad decision that they might regret later. And with okay. respect to academic integrity, um, myself and George Freeman, we're actually trying to change something in ECE. Uh, that might be interesting for students and yourself to know. Uh, we're trying to implement an uh, honor code system. So basically what we want to do eventually, if it passes at the department level, we'll be the first department on campus to implement this. And basically we will eliminate, basically the, the students monitor, self-monitor and we're going to have to try and create a different culture where the students and the profs have uh, trust each other. So uh, it's been done at other universities successfully. So we're, we're examining whether or not we should bring it into ECE. Good luck with that. And I hope it works. Um, let us know. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, uh, we're, we, I actually presented to the department. Feedback, preliminary feedback seemed to be okay. There's some concerns, obviously, because they feel that we're opening a Pandora's box, right? If the students aren't being constantly checked and monitored, then they're going to cheat. Uh, whereas the research tends to show that if, if we trust them and if they self-monitor, so one of the things about the academic integrity honor code is they have to report anyone cheating. And uh, so that becomes part of it. And it, the research seems to indicate that it does actually, I, 
almost paradoxically reduce the amount of cheating. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, I just wanted to kind of say out loud, I kind of messaged in the chat, but if any first years have any questions, you can message them in the chat. We also had like a few questions that they had submitted and uh, certain people who are not in the right time zone asked if we could record the video for them. So um, I just wanted to confirm with everybody if that's okay if we just recorded the video for those students who are, um, well, it's, it's like 3 a.m. right now and they can't necessarily participate. So uh, I'm Ryan Delert. So I'm part of the ECE Society as a uh, co-VP academic. And uh, I, guess, I guess I could do an introduction to the ECE Society. So the ECE Society is a, a group of elected students, essentially, um, who, who, who run events like this one and, and resume critique, although we haven't had one this term. And uh, uh, other, other responsibilities um, include uh, things like the EC lounge and, and everything in it, you know, furniture. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I, suppose, I suppose the professors can also introduce themselves. I, I'm Dave Wong. I'm the first year academic advisor. I'm also teaching EC 190, the engineering professionalism course. I'm Serge Delestio uh, in the math faculty teaching math 117. I'm Ryan Trilford. I'm from the math faculty as well, and I'm teaching uh, math 115. I'm Gazal Gijani, also math, uh, from math. Um, I'm teaching math 115. I'm Anders Bergstrom from uh, the arts faculty. I'm teaching Arts 190. It's the communication engineering profession. My name is Nina Winner. I'm also from MAF and I'm one of the instructors of MAF 115. And actually, this is the first time that I'm teaching at the University of Waterloo. And I'm Werner Dietl and I teach EC 150 this term. Uh, I'm Logan Crew. I'm a research assistant professor with the Department of Combinatorics and Optimization, and I'm an instructor for Math 115. Okay. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to repeat one more time. If the first years have any questions, you can just write them in the chat and we can kind of read them out loud or we can unmute you and things like that. Um, but we do have a few questions that we just kind of have certain students submit. So I think that we can start with those questions and then kind of if anybody has any follow up questions, they can kind of add them as we're going. So um, the first question we have submitted would be um, whether professors have a preference between teaching uh, first year students and upper year students. Is there like a preference to, I don't know, like seeing a whole new wave of fresh eager students or people who are, have already kind of gone through some university? Um, I can go, yeah. Um. So I can tell you one thing, it's much harder to teach first year and first year in students uh, as opposed to third year students. So I do put a lot more effort to prepare a lecture for first year students for good reason, because they haven't settled in, they're going through the transition. So you want to make it as much as, much as smooth as possible. So they get into the culture of university and learning. And then you feel like, for example, with our courses in math, you're putting the foundation for what will come afterwards. So if you put do something wrong, then they will suffer for the rest of the year. So that's why we, I find it much harder. Um, more people can answer if they'd like. It's definitely, it's definitely a challenge because, but it's also a privilege to teach first year students. I've had the opportunity, uh, even in my uh, engineering communication class, first, you know, especially when meeting on campus uh, in past years, I, you know, students have told me, you are my very first university professor. And that's, uh, you know, helps set the expectations and the, 
the norms for what the shift from high school to, to university is. And uh, I take that pretty seriously. I, so I enjoy it. But I, I will echo what others have said that you have to take, uh, you know, special preparations for first years who, who don't understand the norms uh, of university, let alone of particular faculties and classes and things like that. So most of my teaching is uh, to first and second year students. Um, I enjoy teaching basically any class, any student, any faculty, really. But um, there are pros and cons. I mean, um, when I taught a, an upper year course, it was a fourth year slash grad course in my research area. I mean, there it felt like I died and went to heaven because it was so beautiful. It was right in my area. Uh, there I found that the lecture preparation is a lot more work because um, there's a lot more detail in the material when teaching first and second year courses, although the lecture prep is a lot easier because the material is easier, um, you have to present it in a way that it can, the students can really adapt and learn from it. Especially when math is like a tool to a lot of students that we teach. It's not their primary, if you're teaching engineers, for example, it's a tool. Um, it's not their area that they want to pursue. So you have to make it as exciting as you can. And also with the first year classes, it's, it's larger, they tend to be larger and therefore um, there's a different dynamic that you have to create within the class and a different kind of rapport. Um, all right, cool, um, moving forward. Um, uh, one of the bigger questions that actually a few students asked was why did you choose to become a professor slash lecturer? Like why was this something you wanted to go into? And again, it's open for anybody. <laughs> this, uh, it wasn't actually something I planned. Um, when I started my master's, they said, by the way, your duty is to go teach this tutorial. And I was, I was pretty terrified of it. And after I did it the first time, I'm like, nope, this is actually the thing that I, I want to be doing. And uh, I spent the next, I guess, my master's and my PhD teaching lots of tutorials and eventually courses. And it's just kind of something that I've just done for a long time and I've enjoyed more and more as, as time goes on. Add on to what Ryan's saying. I mean, it's a combination of what you love doing and um, what life gives you the opportunity to do, too, sometimes. I've always enjoyed math and known I wanted to go into math. And as I went through my um, PhD program, I found I enjoyed math research and I enjoyed teaching math. And there's a few ways you can go from there. Professor is one of them. Um, there are some companies that do research. There's a handful of ways to go. As it turns out, my uh, wife got offered a position at Waterloo. She's also a uh, assistant professor here. And um, we managed to work, to work it out so that I would get a position here also. So I thought I wanted to be a professor for a decent amount of my time in grad school. And it's also true that when the opportunity came up, I wanted to go for it. And I'm very happy to be here. You know, it's funny students ask that question. Uh, but university has always been a part of my life because my, my dad was, is a university professor. And funny enough, my dad is an engineering professor. So, um, but I, I went to the other side of campus to the arts, studied humanities and uh, literature and film and media studies. And that's what I pursued as my passion. Uh, and I always loved sharing what my research uh, and interests were about. And had a passion for teaching in general. I, I've taught high school and middle school as well before I went back to do my PhD. So ed education is definitely a passion of mine. And then the University of Waterloo, uh, the communications initiative allowed me to return back to full circle to what, uh, you know, what I grew up around, which was the, the engineering <laughs> faculty, which is pretty cool. In fact, my dad is a graduate of the University of Waterloo. Uh, mechanical not easy so uh but uh so that's kind of fun and you know I, I share with him what we're doing here and pass things by him and you know he's pretty excited about that opportunity for me to share some of the communication skills and stuff we've developed with students so yeah you know I guess I always kind of wanted to be a prof I like the lifestyle even though there are times like right now where it just consumes everything and it's like how do you you know because people think it's like prof so you know, it's yes, I love my job and it's fun. That's why I want to do it because I, I like what I'm teaching, but it's also, it can be all consuming in a way that I don't know that every career is like. So I don't know. I th I'm sure my colleagues can attest to that as well. 
All right, um, moving forward, um, a lot of students wanted to know like specific tips and tricks for each class, like moving forward, like is there something that they Royals should be doing? I was an undergrad student and uh, I was an engineering undergrad student, by the way, and then I saw the light and switched to mathematics <laughs> for my PhD. Uh, but nonetheless, I knew uh, that's what I wanted to do, but I just didn't realize how long of a haul it would be to get here. Um, you do your master's, you do your PhD, and then in my case, I had to do some postdocs as well. But when you're here, it's fantastic, and I wouldn't trade my job for the world. You know, I've, been, uh, I've been a prof for 32 years now. So... <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's been good. It, it's one of the few jobs where, you know, you're, you're always learning. And that's the interesting thing about being a professor is the learning never stops. The students think that they're the only ones learning, but the professors are constantly learning, doing research. Uh, so it's, it's a great job. And uh, I've got four more years before I retire, so. Uh, okay. Uh, moving forward. Sorry, I keep cutting out, so I'll have to be turning off my camera every so often. Um, so I just don't uh, pause on everybody. But a lot of students wanted to know some tips and tricks for each class. So if one of you can kind of give like a tip and trick to do how to succeed, whether it's like, um, I don't know, mental breaks or kind of like making sure to uh, make other types of notes besides just copying down the lecture notes. So um, and if you guys want to take turns going and answering that one, you guys could go ahead. Well, EC 190 is basically the first part of that course is teaching how to teach. Uh, a lot, not a whole lot of students went to look at the note taking video that I put up. Only about 10% of the class did. So again, the tips are there. Uh, the first year office has lots of stuff. The students aren't using it though. Uh, there, there are a lot, you know, um, but the note taking is huge. You know, reviewing your notes seems like very time consuming, but it's gonna save you a boatload of time by the time you get the final exam, because otherwise you have to relearn everything. So anyways, the, the video is up on the 190 site if anyone wants to take a look at it, but I've got a whole video on how to take notes and things like that. And scheduling. Notes and scheduling are the two, when I, in 1B, when I'm dealing with the first year 1A failures, those are the two biggest things, two biggest reasons why students fail. But unfortunately, with online learning, they're not taking notes that much, right? I mean, uh, this is, um, I feel for these students uh, because they had their last year of high school was compromised and their transition year to university is compromised. This is, uh, they're missing out on all that um, social activities and, and learning in a, in a classroom environment. Um, it's, it's really sad, uh, but this is life, right? And, and we just have to move on. I, I, we're lucky technology is at a point where we can move forward. And that's been, I think, a blessing of the pandemic is that it's caused us all, even professors, to rethink how we teach and to use these tools, the technology. It's fantastic because when this is over, and it will end, uh, I'm going to use some of the stuff and the videos that I'm doing to actually complement my in-class stuff. So some stuff has come some good stuff has come out of this, um, but I feel for these students in particular. So for EC150, my advice doesn't really depend on the uh, current situation. It's to do things that are not worth grades. So there are a few assessments that uh, programming exercises that are not worth grades, and many students don't seem to do them. And so to do these exercises that are not worth, they are not assessed as as such, but you just learn how to program. And EC150 is about how to learn to program. So just do things to practice, do things that are not graded, and then talk to a TA if you get stuck on these exercises. I uh, agree with that completely. Um, in Math 115, we post a bunch of practice problems. Um, I don't know if students are really attempting them or not. Uh, and I find that if a student doesn't understand something, they're less likely to practice it. They'll go and practice other stuff that they already kind of know. And so I guess my advice is, you know, do the practice problems without looking at the solutions and try to focus on the stuff that you, you don't fully understand. Because if you're just doing problems that you kind of know how to do, it feels good to get that answer for sure. But you you didn't really learn anything because you already knew that, right? So put yourself out there um, and get used to 
struggling a little bit. Uh, when you struggle to figure out something um, and then you get it, it's yours. You're not going to forget that. And it's a really awesome feeling when you finally figure out a problem on your own that you've struggled with. Uh, it's just fantastic. And so, um, and you remember it and it's yours and then you've, you've learned something and you're more confident to push forward again in the future. So uh, definitely don't be afraid to struggle and, and, and learn material. Maybe it's uh, one that I find um, very important even when you when you teach in person, but maybe it's even more important when you teach um, virtual is that, that people should not be afraid to ask, right? And I mean, for my own <laughs> university time, I remember that we were just encouraged to ask questions because if you have the question, probably more than 50% of the class also has this question. And so, but um, when you are just in front of your laptop, then you don't, you, you don't know whether the other students also have to question or not. So um, yeah, don't don't be afraid to ask when you didn't understand something or don't be afraid to ask your peers and just to get help in particular when you're alone in front of your, yeah, in front of your laptop. I think uh, one of the things that's the challenge for students who Put your phone away try to mute chat things while you're learning that to me is a really important thing and, and focus on that um, but yeah also structure so my course set up so there's a structure so that you know beginning of the week lectures and, and videos and readings and everything comes up assignments and activities to be done uh, to be completed by the end of the week so there's a rhythm to it and then I would say it's very important to then to build in a, uh, a rest day a day where you uh, probably aren't doing, you're doing things that are, uh, you know, stepping away from work. I know that's going to sound insane and students tell me all the time, they're like, I don't have time. I know engineering students are taking six courses and they're busy, 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 but it's like, you know, in grad school, I had this same uh, conversations with other, other people. They'd be like, I'm like, it's Friday night, let's go out. And they'd be like, I can't, I'm writing a paper. I'm like, you're not writing a paper. You're sitting in the library chatting on Facebook well uh and pretending like you're working and so it's like you work when you work and you play when you play that's what i think really really hard to do because the online world has, has blurred the lines between work and play in our life and so trying to create some sort of structure that reestablishes that is really really important right I th so that's really i mean i don't know i try to teach that through by building structure into a course but you know i begin began uh both my engineering communication courses here, we watched a video where we talked about this concept of ambient connectivity, which is that even when you, and I, I show this video and we talk about it even in, when we're in person, because I, when someone has a phone on their desk, it's like all those people, even if you're not chatting on it, you're ambiently connected to those people. They, the potential for a message to come through is distracting because there's a tiny part of your brain psychology that's just, you know, maybe I can check Facebook or, I don't know what people do now, uh, Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, but you know, so working when you got to work and having some time to refresh yourself when you're not, I think that's really, really important. And you could say we don't have time for it, but then, then it's a time management issue. Right? So that would be my biggest advice. Also following up on what, um, on what he was saying, also try to do this break thing with the different kinds of work also. Some people maybe can do it where they spend one entire day working on one class, trying to smash through an assignment for a due date. Some people maybe work fine with that. I don't know if that's the case, but a lot of people don't. <laughs> um, your brain does a better job of working on different sorts of things consecutively. And it also does a better job of when you're resting and when you're not thinking about something, your brain is automatically synthesizing that information, even subconsciously. If you spend four different one hour sessions during a week of studying for a class, that's generally going to do a lot more good than one single four hour session. This doesn't always apply to everyone, but definitely if you have trouble keeping up with stuff and don't think you're getting enough out of it, try that and really try to space out different kinds of activities. And one other thing I wanted to add, make sure you get sleep. It's really easy to not get sleep. I've been there. 
I've been an undergrad. I've had plenty of sleepless nights. I would not recommend it, and it was not a good idea. You do a lot better when you get sleep, even if you think you can't get sleep. You do so much better with sleep, and when you don't have sleep, you're slower, and then you would have would lose time that you would have probably had back anyway just by sleeping. I don't know if this is still as much of a problem with this online setting where people are still at home, but it's really, really easy to fall into that. I've been there, but it's not worth it, and it doesn't help things, and it's very unhealthy. Get some sleep and get some relaxation. Sometimes it helps a lot. Uh, in the past, we've done some surveys, and there's a huge statistical link between sleep and academic performance. So, yeah, what Logan's saying is absolutely true. People who aren't getting sleep, their marks are actually plummeting. So there's a huge link. There's not a whole lot of things that we've surveyed that seems to link to academic performance, but that's definitely one of them. Um, uh, other, oh, I think there's a question in the chat. Uh, this is for math profs. Any tips for uh, rigorous proofs? Sometimes I find it a bit hard to get all the points. You should state. I think uh, practice is the uh, the best thing here. Um, typically, when you're when you're given a proof, you know you're given a statement. And you have to you have to. Um, my end result what am I shooting for uh, and in your rough work you know you can look at you know what you can assume you know are there any definitions I can use is there any way I can get an equation in here and then look at the end result and say okay you know what does that mean you can kind of work backwards and meet in the middle now this is not how the proof will actually go when you write it out it's got to flow from beginning to end but when you're doing your rough work you can do whatever you want right so be writing out definitions you know thinking about where am I starting where am I going to how can I get there um, you know and each each step in your proof um, should say, you know, like, okay, how did I get from here to here? Is it clear what I did? Did I use a theorem? Cite the theorem. You know, did I use a result that uh, is obvious to me? We'll write that off, write that result down anyway. You want the reader who's reading your proof and marking it to uh, understand uh, your logic, right? Not that you're just writing things down, but that you understand what you did, right? And that's the, uh, you know, it, it takes practice. It's easy to say, but it does take, uh, you know, practice, right? So the, I always try to include a few proof questions in Math 115 on each uh, assignment and on the practice problems as well uh, to build in some, some time for you to practice those. An important thing that Ryan said, by the way, in there that you should really keep in mind, your readers of your proof are not you. It's really important to remember that you might be glossing over details that other people don't get. Some people occasionally even write things and proofs that they learned in high school. We don't go to the same high schools. I didn't go to high school in Canada. Some of, some of the TAs are going to high school in China or elsewhere. So definitely take a little bit of a careful look at your assumptions if you state anything that isn't already in the lecture notes. That's one thing I've seen come up a lot. As far as writing rigorous proofs, if you find that you're constantly getting comments on not doing that, Include every step. Try writing down a proof where you literally, if it's an equation to an equation, just literally write exactly what the definition is next to each thing as you go. Make sure you're understanding where you're using which things. And write it as specifically as possible until you start getting a feel for which things you can leave off a bit more and which things you can write in a better way to make it more clear. It's basically impossible to be too specific when you're writing a proof. It can take longer to write, but it'll be correct but you're going to have trouble getting someone to believe your proof if you leave off details. So if you find you have trouble with it, just write literally everything. Start getting the feel for which details are, are important and which ones you can start figuring out how to incorporate more smoothly. All right, another question. What is the biggest reason students fail first year, whether it's 1A or 1B? Uh, I can answer that since I, I see the students. <laughs> um, again, I had mentioned uh, note taking and poor scheduling are the two. And the third one is students just give up. They don't persevere. They have one bad result and they just, they just you know, throw, the, throw in the towel. So yeah, so there's three things from my experience, because I deal with the failures in one, one B, the students 
who are either failed or very close to failing. Uh, I'll, you know, uh, th that, those are the three biggest that I've seen. Uh, okay, uh, moving forward. Uh, okay, if a student has fallen behind, what would you recommend would be a good way for them to catch up? What are, what are some like techniques that they should try using in order to catch up? I think the first step is maybe to get an overview of how far did the student get, so how far did he or she understand the material and where is it um, that he or she got lost. And then, um, then it also depends a little bit, is it just one of the courses? This is all courses. And if it is all courses, then I would suggest to decide which course to focus on, maybe to prioritize. Um, but if it is just, just one course, then, then prioritize this course. And uh, in math, I actually, when someone really thinks that um, he or she doesn't know what to do and he doesn't understand the theory, then I give the advice, go to the examples and start with the examples and understand every step of the example. Because then you actually have to go to the theory, but then you learn the theory in a very concrete example and you're not lost in this higher level or more abstract explanations. So this is what I suggest. Get an overview, and then prioritize your courses, keep to the schedule or the other advices and go to the, take a look at the, ex at the examples and understand the examples. Okay. Um, I just want to throw in there as well. One thing is uh, TAs and professors, especially office hours are totally underutilized. That's going to be the quickest way to catch up. Uh, is to get your questions, do what Nina suggested, but then go see a prof, go see a TA, talk to your group members. We have them set up in EC 190. Um, don't just try and fumble through it yourself. You've got some, you know, a lot of help. And it's, I don't know about the rest of the professors here, but I suspect office hours are very poorly attended. Depends on if there's an assignment coming up or not. Yeah. But no, that's good advice that I would say that there's probably, uh, I haven't done the, the research, but anecdotally a, a connection between the students who regularly ask questions and come to office hours and the ones who are doing well. Um, okay, uh, also a lot of some questions, oh, some students had questions about grad school and industry and they're wondering about how one would get like started about thinking about grad school or what it's like being in the, in grad school. Anyone can answer this one. <laughs> So I went to grad school in math, so I can talk about it from that perspective. I don't know how, how relevant this will be to the engineering people, but maybe for some of them. Um, for math, at least, one thing, that I, one thing that I did was I started preparing early in the sense that once I got to like my second year of undergrad towards the end of it and I started realizing that I really wanted to definitely go to grad school, you look at what they look for. And, and so one big thing is recommendation letters. And some of that's going to come about naturally, but honestly, a great thing you can do, at least for math, and I suspect this is probably true for other places, put yourself in a position where you can get some good time with professors, some quality time where they'll know you in a context that matters. Seek out actively things like I did an undergraduate thesis in mathematics. I did a one-on-one -on -one project there. I did a summer camp REU where I worked with somebody. Um, I put myself in situations where I would have that close contact working with just a few professors who would get to know me, get to know my abilities, be able to talk about me in a way that sounds very strong. And that's important to make sure you make those connections, make sure you get into that habit. And that also preps you for what higher level work's going to be like. It's going to be more independent. It's going to be more working on a project of that sort that's not necessarily going to have a concrete answer. And that experience looks great and is important too. And as far as the actual grad school goes, at least for me and my thing, and I think this is true in math for sure, you generally will do a couple of years of very intense graduate courses. And then you start transitioning more into some topics courses with a mix of research, and then you kind of go full research for your thesis. 
Uh, I would assume something somewhat similar probably applies in many PhD programs where you learn some of the basics and then start doing work towards the thesis. So that's the sort of thing that it would look like and um, you'll go forward doing. Uh, okay, and then um, are there any interesting upper year courses or technical electives that you might want to recommend students to uh, kind of look into or take? I don't know, I, I feel like this, uh, I don't know, I feel like this is a lot of uh, the profs here are very math faculty or things like that, so I don't know. I don't um, think anyone's going to take any upper year arts courses, unfortunately, but they're a lot of fun. <laughs> I am taking an arts course as an elective right now, actually. So what are you, what are you taking? I'm taking Psych 256. So it's it's not like first year, but I'm still taking it. So yeah. and half my class is like engineering students. So that's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> well, our comm studies upper year courses, we offer uh, stuff that's quite, I think, practical. We offer courses on like leadership and interviewing and organizational behavior from a communicative aspect and stuff like that as well as you know some more uh communication studies and media studies theory so might be of interest to people yeah. i would love to love to teach a class on science fiction to engineers that's my passion one day i want to do i'll have to talk to engineering about that because i actually think that it could be a really good course yeah it might some uh, ideas might be a little bit more realistic in movies, hopefully. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, other questions, let's see. Uh, how do you feel about like delivering courses online? Like what goes on through your head when you're like recording a video or some sort? Um, again, open question. <laughs> I can't speak for me personally in terms of recording videos and stuff because um, I haven't done that. I'm doing um, video office hours in Math 115 also, but um, I do know for sure it's weird. It's weird both teaching in office hours and it's weird recording videos because you can't see the people that you're trying to teach to either because they're, well, not there because it's asynchronous or even in office hours, usually I can't really see the people either because, well, they can't have their video on because bandwidth would make them thing work worse anyway, or even if their video is on, it's just not the same as getting that close feel. So it's, it's difficult to gauge sometimes how much students are actually getting. And this makes that communication very important too. I at least try to reasonably often send out emails with little polls verifying what people want to hear more about. I definitely encourage people to say, you know, when things aren't making sense because the professors just can't tell as easily. It's harder to tell that in an online setting. And we need that feedback. We need to know what we're doing right, what could be better, what you don't understand. And um, that's really the main thing. There's just more uncertainty online. Anytime there's more barriers, more layers between communication directly between people, it makes that message harder and harder to see how it's being received. I found that uh, making the videos for Math 115, I found it really hard to, to be myself as an instructor. Um, I usually get uh, a little bit excited when I teach linear algebra because I really like it. And I found that was very hard to do in the lecture videos. Uh, sometimes I feel like it sounds almost a bit monotonous. Uh, and part of that is um, there's like, uh, as Logan mentioned, there's no faces uh, to see. I don't know who I'm talking to when I make the videos or who will ever be watching them and I don't know if they're understanding what I'm doing or not. And so I found that to be um, extremely challenging. And also it can be frustrating to make the video sometimes. You get through it and then you realize that um, there was like five errors in your lecture notes and you have to go fix them and reshoot the video and, and uh, you know a one hour video can take four, five, six hours to make. Um, and so it's, I really miss being on campus. I miss seeing students. I miss interacting with the students and talking to them and seeing their faces and being excited about uh, teaching them. Um, teaching online, I mean, I'm still excited to talk about math, of course, and I love having my iPad. It's, it's tough and we're all kind of learning to do our best as, as we get through this. Oh, and we have a question in the chat. 
Uh, what do you think is the most important thing you look for in a student? Um, uh, don't know if there's any specific parts to it, but that's what the question asks. <laughs> I mean, uh, one thing I think that's good for any student and anything is curiosity. If you're a student, you it should be important that you want to learn things. That's not always going to be true. Everybody has to take some required courses. Everybody's going to take a few things that they don't get. But even about those things, try to find some part of it you're curious about. Why are you being required to take this? What's important about it? The more you feel like something's worth knowing, the easier it is to learn. People who are naturally curious, who take things and find more about them, want to know about them. That just helps regardless of whether you're a student or a graduate student or going into research. That natural drive is an important part, that desire to know more. Sounds good. Uh, trying to see if we have any more questions here. Um, I don't know, a lot of students kind of want to hear if there are any funny stories or something like that surrounding. I think that's kind of what like kind of helps students connect with profs, whether it's like policy 71 stories or things like that because i know you see at least my year is pretty notorious for that unfortunately so yeah so <laughs> i don't know i thought i'd bring it up i guess uh, from what i gather some one of the highlights of my office hours is that they like my cat <laughs> it's very nice to be able to share to share um to share my family my cat and some and occasionally my wife comes in and says hi it's nice. <laughs> it's nice to have some human aspects there. It's something you can get out of this pandemic situation. Um, I don't know. Uh, if, does anyone want to bring up anything else to talk about? I feel like we've, on our end, we may have run out of questions. But um. well, I mean, maybe not a funny story, but something that I um, find where I'm myself sometimes amused is that really like this um, kind of weird interaction during the office hours when you see that 30 people are online but then you do a poll and three people answer the poll and you're like okay <laughs> what are we going to do now right and then uh, you try to ask a question and I mean also in class if I try if I ask the questions then people usually they just need time to answer to answer the question right but now in this virtual setting I don't know are they taking a shower do they get a coffee are they asleep are they are they even there or do they just need time to answer the question right so it is very difficult to feel the room and sometimes during the class I actually I have to laugh and then I said okay just mute your I, I mute myself take a sip of my coffee and wait for two minutes if someone shows up it gives an answer or not right this is just how it goes and um so yeah this is kind of funny and i think this is also where and the human side so somehow shows a little bit right so yeah <laughs> yeah i feel like online just made it really difficult to get people involved in anything like whether it's like everybody's trying to create events to kind of create a sense of community but whether people are joining or not is, I don't know, everybody, I feel like it's always locking no matter what you do, whether it's office hours, polls, or like any attempts to like say things like that. Um, oh, someone actually did ask another question. So that's great. Uh, once school is in person again, and uh, the students right now are finished 1A, is it okay if they drop by and say hi to the profs? Please do. We would love to finally meet you. Uh, I feel like I just yell into my iPad all day long and <laughs> no one really, uh, I don't see anyone. I don't know if they're even looking at me, but I would love to meet the students that I've been teaching. It would be fantastic. Because I mean, it's not only them, it's also us missing out the contact, yeah. right? It is not, as someone said before, it's not only the students, but it's also us learning and this is the same here, right? I mean, it's not only the students missing the social contact or this the learning environment, but it's also us. Yeah. <laughs> I would actually want, also want to go back to something that Katya said that, um, you know, online and people not being sure whether they're doing something right or you make a mistake, like Ryan said in a, in a lecture or whatever, got to be gentle with ourselves in this pandemic. Like we're trying to put things together when it's not normal. It's not going to be normal. It's, pretending otherwise is, is a is, is not 
a good idea. You know, we, we do the best we can with the tools that we have, but be kind to yourself, be kind to your professors too, who are, I think everyone is trying to do the best they can to provide a, you know, great education. And, but here we are online on Zoom. Yeah, um, oh, there's uh, more questions. As a student that grew up in Waterloo, are there any profs here that have attended any high schools in Kitchener or Waterloo? No? I, uh, I didn't attend at any uh, school. Actually, I did come to Waterloo for a bit. Um, I had already done some school uh, out in Alberta where I was living at the time. And so I came here and they gave me a bunch of transfer credits that they really should not have given me. Uh, so I ended up being in uh, late second year and uh, had never seen a proof before. Um, so it was a disaster. I ended up uh, immediately moving back to Alberta. I did all my school there. And then when I applied to the, the job here, I remember being terrified because I'm like, what if they find out that I was a student here before and I didn't finish? Anyways, no one said anything and I somehow managed to get the job. So that's fantastic. But I was actually born in Ontario and I did live in Kitchener um, when I was growing up. And I have a traumatic memory from Kitchener. I, when I was really little, I was about two or three years old and I was standing beside my building and I looked up at the sky and I saw the clouds moving, but I didn't know the clouds moved. So I thought the building was falling over. And I remember being really terrified that the building was falling over. And um, I, I recently, because uh, now I live in Kitchener again, I asked my parents, where did we live? And it turns out I live uh, about two blocks away from that house. So I drove by it and I, I suddenly remembered all of that stuff that happened. It was interesting. So um, yes, I did technically kind of go to Waterloo for a few days and I did live in Kitchener a long time ago. That's funny. I have a similar to, to Ryan. I, I lived in Waterloo when I was very little because as I mentioned, my dad uh, was doing his PhD at, at Waterloo. And then we moved away when he got his professor job and now I'm back. So it's kind of full circle. It's quite funny. I'm relearning all of the stuff that they talked about. So. All right. Uh, I think we're going to start wrapping it up. I was just wondering if there's any last little words of wisdom you'd like to leave on the students, especially those that might be um, international and might not be able to ask any questions real time. But um, yeah, I feel like that might be a good way to end it. I love the questions. Great. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, again, thank you so much. And so the students would also like to say thank you for putting up with all the emails, despite the tone at times. And I can say that the same for uh, all the students. Sometimes people get frustrated with technology and it's really easy to get frustrated with people when you can't see them face to face. So, um, again, thank you again for attending the event and um, I wish you all the best and I hope everybody stay safe. Bye. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and answering the student questions. Thank you to the students for asking questions. Oh, so, I hope it was I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it will be. As uh, uh, who who said it? Um, when when a student asks a question, uh, fifty percent of the other students also have the same question. So. Thank, Thank you, you all. <laughs> Bye. All right, see you.